ready for the word. All right, cool. So uh, last week I was talking about uh, uh, prospering a little bit from the, that verse, 3 John, uh, verse 2. And uh, really last week we talked about kind of the two root systems, right, for th thriving, prospering in life, which was really knowing that God has given us right standing with him in Christ, right, and feeding on that, and also knowing that God loves us personally, powerfully, and feeding on that. And those two things really set us up for uh, just thriving in life, thriving and growing well in life. So I want to continue a little bit with some of these thoughts, though this is called Prosper in Life with a Pure Heart, um, because what God was impressing on me yesterday as I was spending that time with him is that he really, really does want us to prosper, right? Again, uh, if you're a parent, a grandparent, a step-parent, anything like that, uh, how many want your kids to be successful, to thrive, right? To be healthy, to be happy. If you don't want that, something wrong, right? <laughs> that's, that's, right? And how much more does God want that for us, right? And, you know, I've heard that the, the whole word prosperity and that whole thing, it's supposed to be controversial somehow, but I don't get it. Uh, where, did the, where did the concept come from? The Bible. <laughs> Old Testament, New Testament, it's just, it's throughout, right? That's, that's God expressing his heart. And so I don't know why that would ever be controversial, uh, but... You know, I don't let anybody else define that for me. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with what the Bible says there. God wants us to prosper and thrive in life. Um, however, does he want us to be spoiled, entitled, selfish? No. Surprise. Of course he doesn't, right? Parents also know that one too. If you're a parent, do you want your kids to be spoiled and entitled and selfish? Or do you want your children to have good character, humility, respect, love, kindness, right? Okay, and that's kind of what we're talking about. God is a parent, isn't he? He's a father, and we are born again, so we are his, literally his born-again children, sons and daughters. And uh, he is going to shape our character, isn't he? It's a big deal. It's a real big deal. He's shaping our hearts, shaping our character, shaking, shaping our nature and, and how we you know, think, how we treat people, all kinds of things. He's very interested in shaping us. Uh, ultimately, does he want us to prosper? Yes, yes. Uh, but if you have a choice, if you're raising your own kids and you have a choice at this moment between giving them everything they want and shaping their character, what generally goes first? character, right? If you have any sense at all, right? If we have any, if we have any sense going on here at all, shaping their character is always a huge priority, right? We do want to bless them. We do want them to thrive. We want them to be successful. We want them to be healthy and happy. But man, shaping their character is big, isn't it? And God's the same way, right? Ultimately. And so he wants us to, to thrive and prosper in life, um, but he's also shaping us and we want to recognize that and, and to cooperate with that. So let's, let's read the verse, um, third John Verse 2, it's only one chapter there, so it's verse 2. And he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Again, we talked about that. That was accomplished at the cross. All of that is the work of the cross. I mean, that's not some pie-in-the-sky wish, right? That's, that's the work of the cross. Uh, he redeemed us. Jesus redeemed us from the curse so we could be blessed, redeemed us from poverty so that we would be prospered. He redeemed us from sickness and disease. By his stripes we are healed, increasing in health, and it also says that the chastisement for our peace was upon him, that's Isaiah, right, and that, that he was, he literally redeemed us from torment of mind, from affliction, mental affliction, all those things so we can have a, a healthy head, right, a healthy inside of our head, that's the work of the cross, we want to receive that, he calls us beloved, and he pray that you may prosper in all things, uh, look that up in the Greek, you know what it really means in the Greek? All things, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Just means it's translated perfectly. It means all things. He wants us to thrive and prosper, right? Uh, that's good news, isn't it? That's God's heart. That's his nature. Uh, but one of the, the, the concepts that God really impressed on me yesterday as I was in prayer there is uh, the word entitlement. And, uh, and I'm just going to go with it because he was really impressing on me that he, he wants us to be blessed and prosper. He does not want us to be entitled. And there's a real difference, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a fine line, and I want to I wanna try and clarify it, because is every blessing put in the covenant that we have in Christ? Yes. Is every right, every privilege, every blessing in our covenant in Christ? Yes. It's done. But at the same time, God doesn't want us to have that kind of entitled attitude. Well, like, God, you just owe me. You know, God, I, I shouldn't have to pray. I shouldn't have to seek you. I shouldn't have to listen to you or respond to you. I get to sit on the couch and you send me every blessing postage paid, right? That's entitlement, right? I shouldn't have to like spend time with you and listen to your voice or get my heart aligned with you or, you know what I'm saying? Seek after you. Uh, so the entitlement is, God, you just send it postage paid because it's in the covenant and, you know, 
if you get my if you get my drift there, then we're in a good place. So uh, let's uh, let's look at uh, Luke five one through eleven. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the two sides here. The one side I want to talk about first is is really getting us to understand that God does want us to prosper, that He does want us to thrive and grow in success and health and happiness and all those things. He truly does, and I want to show you this scripturally. Um, at the same time, then I'm gonna talk about uh, getting rid of any attitude that sabotages us, because God wants us to be champions, doesn't He? Champions in life, absolutely. Jesus is our champion, but then He turns us into champions, and so we want to learn how champions think. And so we will talk about some attitudes and some thought processes that are sabotaging, self-sabotaging, that are not champion thinking. And uh, so then if we have those, we can just go, ha, don't want that, right? I don't want that. All right, so in Luke 5, uh, 1 through 11 is the story when, remember when Jesus fills Peter's nets with fish, right, and calls him into the ministry. Uh, I want to read this and then uh, share some thoughts. So it was as the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. And then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And my impression of this is, uh, what did Peter actually expect? Nothing. <laughs> He's, I fished all night. I'm just letting you know, there's no fish today. They're nowhere close. And uh, we've worked all night. I'm tired. But if you say so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is the beginning of their relationship. Peter doesn't quite know what to expect yet, does he? And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. I mean, the Holy Spirit moved, the, mo the moment Jesus said, let down the nets, the Holy Spirit went, I'm on it. And every fish for a mile around is swimming toward the net, right? <laughs> and their nets breaking and they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that the boats began to sink. They're just overloaded with blessing. Uh, and when Simon, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Right? For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. Right? So that's the moment uh, Peter is called into the ministry. So I'm calling you out of the fishing business. Now you're going to fish for the souls of men, right? And here's, here's part of the, well, I'll, I'll, let's read the last verse then, and then I'll comment. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed Jesus, right? Like, oh yeah, we're, we're following you. We're in. So uh, the moment that, that Jesus calls Peter and these other guys also to, uh, to ministry, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, what Jesus just gave them was a picture of great blessing and success, didn't he? He said, they, they said, we, f we fished all night long on our own power, implied and got nothing. However, Jesus speaks one word and boom, right? Their, their, their nets are filled. And so the implication there, Jesus saying, you follow me, there's success. You follow me, there's fruitfulness, there's blessing, there's abundance, right? That's it. And it's an implied promise. I mean, he didn't flat out say it that way. He just filled their nets with fish and said, figure it out, right? Here's a picture of blessing and increase. And, and it's not just for their ministry. That's, that's an implied promise for all of us, isn't it? That God gave us that picture as, a, as an implied promise. Like if you walk with Jesus, whatever he calls you to do, should you expect to prosper? Should you expect to grow in success, grow in influence, grow in blessing, grow in fruitfulness? Yes, absolutely. Should you expect for your life to be increasingly blessed walking with Jesus? Yes. Does that mean we will never have problems? No. <laughs> Jesus said in this world, you'll have tribulation. In this world, you'll have opposition, right? The, he absolutely said, you're going you're gonna to go through problems, trials, tribulations. It's just part of, the, it's part of being in this world. Uh, you don't get out of it. God's blessing doesn't mean you'll, you'll always be comfortable and everything will can be convenient. God's blessing doesn't mean that at all. He will stretch us. He will shape us, right? I mean, did I mention he will stretch us? And did I mention he will stretch us, right? He will stretch us and we'll have opposition. But he said, I'll be with you. You'll get stronger. Your roots will get deeper. You'll become 
you know, a champion, you become everything I want you to be, and I'm going to teach you how to think, right? So there's nothing about this that means everything is, you know, flowery beds of ease. Uh, on the contrary, we're disciples, and he's turning us into champions. But the implied picture here is, I can fill your nets. You walk with me. Uh, you're not following a loser. You're not following somebody who has no power. You're not following somebody who can't help you and bless you, right? The implied promise there. So the reason I'm reading this is because, again, uh, I had an epiphany on this, uh, on this uh, passage several years back because I, I struggled with uh, not really seeing this as a promise for me, right? I saw that as, well, that's great for Peter. How nice for him, right? Woe is me because I don't have that promise. I don't have that, you know. And, uh, and I didn't realize, you know, that my thinking was kind of, you know, sabotaged in that way. But uh, one day, um, you know, the Holy Spirit's bringing me to this story. He's like, read this story, read the story. And I'm reading it. And, and he's like, what do you see? You know, and he's, you know how the Holy Spirit will sometimes do that. I hope you know, he'll kind of start, you know, talking to you and asking questions. And he's like, look at this, what does this mean? You know, and, and finally, he's showing me like, oh, this is this means that I'm supposed to believe that this is a promise for me. I'm supposed to believe that every promise in the Bible even an implied promise like this picture of full nets is for me. And it was an epiphany. It was a great breakthrough and, and, and hallelujah. And I'm the pastor, you know, so, so, right. So, so if I'm growing too, right, it's okay. We're all growing, but uh, I, I kind of broke through that idea that, oh, some of those promises are for other people, special people, maybe not for me. God wants us to believe every promise in there, even if it's implied is absolutely for you. And he wants you to eagerly embrace it and say, ah, it's for me. I want it, right? Uh, which glorifies God more? If you assume that he's good and every promise is for you, or if you assume that every promise is for somebody else who's more special than you, which glorifies God more? The first one, right, right? When you, when you assume that his, his promises are good, true, and they're for you, it glorifies God so much more. It really, really does. We want to get out of that, get out of any, any thinking like that. Uh, so... Uh, let's read Matthew 15, uh, 21 to 28. It's another instance that's kind of similar to this. Uh, but, you know, still part of this is I really want to convince you, uh, if you're not convinced, that if you follow Jesus, he's got success for you. He doesn't say follow me and, you know, everything will always be difficult and everything will always be hard and, right, you'll never get anywhere, right? But you'll go to heaven, right? He doesn't say that, does he? Really, if, if you're uh, in business, if you're in ministry, if you're uh, in some job, some career, if you're, if you're done with that, but you still have family that you're ministering to, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, Jesus says, I have success for you. I have influence. I have fruitfulness. I have breakthrough. I have, right? I want to bless you. You absolutely need to believe that. You really, really do. Uh, here's the story, Matthew 15, uh, about a Gentile woman whose daughter was demon possessed, and she figured that Jesus was the solution for that. So Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, which is a Gentile area, not normally where he was ministering to the Jewish people. Go ahead. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Ooh, what does that mean? So this woman is not a, uh, not a Jew. She is a Gentile. Uh, somehow she does have some knowledge of the Jewish prophecies and the prophecy of the Messiah, and she's open to this, and she knows that uh, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, is going to be called Son of David, a descendant of King David, and she, she recognizes Jesus from the stories and the reputation that are traveling, and, and she, she says, have mercy on me, my daughter is demon-possessed. Right? And uh, now what's uh, interesting about this is we know uh, scripturally that Jesus came for the Jews first, right? Because they're his covenant people, right? They're the covenant people of God, the covenant of Moses, the Messiah is promised to them first. And so Jesus is basically going to say, I'm here for the Jews first. You're, you're a Gentile. Sorry. Right. Uh, should she, should she call herself disqualified and walk away? She does not do that. In fact, um, she, she does exactly what I'm talking about. She assumes that every promise or every implied promise is for her. She says, I'm a Gentile, but so what? I want it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on. I'm not leaving. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm not going away. Right? And, and uh, Jesus' response to that is, all right. <laughs> Lady, you rock. <laughs> That's great. Right? So, yeah, have mercy on me, son of David. Go ahead. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Get rid of her. She's annoying, right? She's bothering us with her problems. We don't care. 
But Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? I'm here for the Jews first. Sorry, you're a Gentile. And she came and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. I'm not going away. I'm not taking no for an answer. I assume that all of your promises and all of your abilities are for me. Right? That's gutsy, isn't it? Is that arrogance or is that faith? Turns out it's actually faith, right? Right, absolutely, yeah. And, and Jesus likes this. And it, we struggle to get to that place. But when you get to that place, I assume that all of God's promises and abilities are for me. Every promise, every implied promise, Peter's full nets, that's a promise to me. Right? I assume that and I embrace that. Man, you're, you're on good territory then. Right? So he said, I answered, he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Oh, that's horrible. But what's he saying? I, I believe he was speaking a little bit tongue in cheek, you know, a little bit wink, wink, because the Jews called the Gentiles dogs at that point. And she knows that and everybody knows that, you know, and he's like, I'm here for the, I'm here for the Jews right first. Um, <laughs> so go ahead. So he actually loves this woman, right? I mean, he's not, he's not putting her down, but Kind of what he's doing in my understanding he, what he's kind of doing is like show me what you got right i'm just here for the jews and she's like i don't care i'm getting it anyway my daughter needs help and you're the guy i'm not leaving <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, jesus is like come on show me what you got right okay she said yes lord even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table i assume that everything you got is for me and i'm not going away without it i'm getting my breakthrough i'm getting my victory i'm getting my deliverance i'm not leaving without it jesus answered and said to her oh woman <laughs> what does he say great is he doesn't say oh you're so presumptuous who do you think you are you think i'm here for you do you think any of this is for you he doesn't say that does he he said woman you rock you totally get it awesome your daughter's healed boom okay and his disciples go what <laughs> what it's about us it's about us it's not about her look it's about anybody who believes that i'm here for you right anybody who believes that my promises are for you right so your daughter's healed from that very hour. Awesome. Um, Peter also, I don't have it on the screen, but the apostle Peter, uh, remember later on after he, he sees the full nets and right, he becomes a follower of Jesus, he's starting to get this. So uh, remember a time when uh, Peter and the disciples are in a boat crossing that great big lake and Jesus comes walking on the water towards them? Know that story? Yeah. Jesus is literally walking across the water and at first they think it's a ghost, but uh, Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come, which means Peter is assuming if Jesus is walking on the water, he's assuming I could do that. That's for me, right? Is that a right assumption? Yes, actually it is. However, he does not, he, he, Peter is smart enough to do one thing. He says, Lord, if it's you, you tell me to come and then I can do it. Peter knows he doesn't presumptuously say, oh, well, if Jesus is walking on the water, I can walk on the water. That would be presumptuous. And if Peter stepped off the boat onto the water, guess what would happen? Sink, bottom of the lake, done. So, and he knows that, he knows that. So what he knows is, I need Jesus to speak this to me. I need Jesus to, right, activate this, whatever it is. I need Jesus, I need Jesus to do this. And we know that walking on the water is a physical miracle. It's a great physical miracle, but it's also a symbol, a prophetic picture of walking in the supernatural life with Jesus, right? Walking in a fruitful life, a victorious life, eyes on Jesus, every step, eyes on Jesus, every step of our life. We walk on the water. So it's a picture of that. And Peter rightly assumes that's for me, but he also rightly knows I can't do it myself. So he says, Jesus, if it's you speak, say, come, right? And Jesus says, all right. And the other disciples are holding onto the edge of the boat. <laughs> and so Jesus says, yeah, come on, Peter, come, right? And Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. And the, uh, the uh, thing that God showed me many years ago is, yes, he's physically walking on the water and it's a miracle, but really what Peter is walking on is the word that Jesus just spoke. He knows that if Jesus did not say come, he sinks. But Jesus said come, and, and so he's like, all right. The faith is released, it's activated, right? Jesus has authorized this, he's, right? And so Peter is walking on 
the word that Jesus, and Peter is walking on the word that Jesus just spoke. So what does that have to do with us? Again, the principle is assume that every blessing, every miracle, every provision that God has, every promise, every implied promise, assume that it's for you. And that glorifies God. He likes that, right? But also never assume that you can do it yourself. Right? And that if that, that, that's the, the pride or the presumption or the entitlement or whatever else. So assume that I need to have my eyes on Jesus. I need to be hearing his voice. I need to be clinging to Jesus, looking to Jesus, asking Jesus, right? Listening to Jesus, responding to Jesus. This is all about Jesus. I'm walking with him every step of the way. And then can I walk on the water? Yes. Can I live a supernatural life? Yes. Can I thrive and prosper and increase? Yes. And I assume it's for me, but I don't presume that I do it by myself. And if we get that combination, we're good. Right? But there is, the, you know, but God, God was really impressing on me the idea of, you know, entitlement, that we want to identify any entitlement thinking in ourselves and get rid of it. And it, there is some there, right? For, for many of us, there is some. And, you know, entitlement is, is it's a thing in affecting our culture a lot right now. You know, just by virtue of being born, I'm owed everything, right? I'm supposed to have everything provided for me. And that's, that's uh, I don't know where that thinking came from. But uh, I'm not want to talk about that today. I want to talk about spiritual entitlement with God, which is kind of the idea, are all of God's blessings mine in Christ? Yes. Is all his victory, all his provision mine in Christ? Yes. But should I have an entitled attitude? The entitled attitude is, God, God, you just owe it to me. I'm going to sit here on the couch and you send me every blessing postage paid. Okay? Uh, instead of, God, I know that every blessing is mine in Christ. Every victory is mine in Christ. I'm going to go in, in my prayer closet and get alone with you. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to cry out to you. And I'm going to listen to your voice. And I'm going to say, what do I do and how do I do it? I'm going to say, God, give me that breakthrough. God, I believe it's for me. But Jesus, right, speak, come, and I'll step onto the water. Jesus, I need to look at you eye to eye every step of the way. You see what I'm saying, right? So if we have the entitled attitude, I get to sit on the couch and everything is, everything is fine. Eh. Even Jesus himself uh, didn't do that. Jesus himself modeled something, the opposite of entitlement. Because, you know the story, we read it like every two weeks. Jesus is baptized in the river when he's 30 years old, right? Holy Spirit comes upon him like a dove, empowers him. The Father speaks, you're my beloved son and you I'm well pleased. Love that, that whole story. But uh, what does Jesus do immediately after that? After he's filled with the Holy Spirit and power, what does he do immediately after don't talk about it as often. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. Fasting for 40 days, right? And so the, the Spirit's leading Jesus, come in, now come into the wilderness. You're going to be alone. Be alone with God. Be alone with the Father for 40 days. Fast. What is that about? It's about getting your flesh out of the way. It's about getting your flesh and your soul and your self-will and all of that stuff dead and you know behind you and, and getting your heart in tune with God aligned with God and your ears attuned to the voice of God and how the spirit's going to lead you and right and letting that power flow through you without self in the way without self will in the way there's all kinds of things that were happening in 40 days of fasting right and, and who likes fasting anybody want, like fasting 40 days I I've you know you know what happens when you fast hungry I hate hungry right <laughs> but but my point is, did Jesus do it? Yes. Well, why did he have to do it? He's the son of God. He's God incarnate, but he's living as a man, right? He's living as a man. And as a man, he's got flesh like we have flesh. And he's like, I'm going to attune with the father. I'm going to fast. I'm going to right all this stuff. And if Jesus had had an entitled mentality, an entitled mentality, when the Holy Spirit said, go into the desert, you're going to fast 40 days. Jesus would have said, um, no, I don't think so. I didn't sign up for 40 days of not eating. Right? I don't think so. I'm the Messiah. I'm already anointed by the Holy Spirit. I don't need to fast. Right? I got it, I got it in covenant. It's already covered. I'm the Messiah. Listen. Right? But he doesn't have that attitude, does he? He has this heart of extravagant responsiveness to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. And you, you're saying I need to fast 40 days? Okay, beginning now. Boom. And that's what, what, kind of what I'm talking about is extravagant responsiveness to Jesus, right? As our Lord, our Savior, as right, the, our champion who's leading us through life and transforming us and leading us into success and victory and influence, right? Extravagant responsiveness to him, not an entitled attitude. I sit on the couch, Lord, and you send my blessing postage paid. 
right? But instead, go into my prayer closet and seek God's face and say, God, give me the next breakthrough. God, show me what to do next, right? God, speak to me to come and I'll walk on the water with you, all right? Uh, all right. Let's read uh, Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 18. So going all the way back in the Old Testament here to uh, when God had led the children of Israel out of Egypt on the way to the promised land. Uh, plan A was to go in right away. Plan B was for them to spend 40 years in the wilderness, <laughs> which is what happened. And now they're ready to go in and take the promised land again. Moses is speaking to them. And... Uh, by, by the Spirit of God, and he said, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. First of all, notice the promise is that you may live and multiply and possess the land, which means God saying, My will is that you will prosper and thrive and increase and have victory and have fruitfulness and have right all the, all the blessings, that you will live in this blessing. However, in this, this was the old covenant, right? This was the Mosaic covenant, and... Uh, Moses said, by the Spirit of God, every commandment which you got, follow the commandments. And the reason for that at that point is because the, the Israelites' relationship with God is through the law. At that point in that covenant, Israelites' relationship with God was through commandments. That's what they had. And so that's what they were supposed to follow. What does that mean to us today? We are not in the old covenant. We are in the new covenant. Our relationship with God is entirely 100% through Jesus. Amen? In Jesus. So, but what does that mean for us? We're not living by commandments and rules. We're living by Jesus. Jesus is our life. This means we cling to Jesus. We listen to Jesus. We spend time with Jesus. We ask Jesus, what do I do next? We listen to his voice. You know, right? We walk in the water keeping our eyes on Jesus. Our life is Jesus. The entitlement attitude is, eh, I'm saved. I got a ticket to heaven. I'm sitting on the couch. Send me some blessings. Postage paid. Okay? But instead, he's calling us to, to have this life of a, a very responsive heart to him, right? A heart that clings to him and walks with him and listens to him and spends time to him. And when we need a breakthrough, right, we don't say, well, God, you know, I hope you do something about it. When we need a breakthrough, we get in our face before God and say, God, give me the breakthrough, right? And speak his word and speak his promises. And you know what I'm saying, right? right? He wants some zeal. He wants, but for us, it's about Jesus. Go ahead. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Translate that to new covenant, right? Will God bring us through experiences designed to humble us? Yes. Why would you do that? Because we need it, because it's good for us. Does God want a humble heart or a proud, arrogant heart? He wants a humble heart, right? And, and do we just very, very easily have humble hearts? Turns out, no, right? <laughs> Turns out that God, sometimes God has to bring us through stuff that humbles us, strips away our pride, and it's good for us. Because he says, I want to do you good in the end. I want you to thrive and prosper. But pride is <clears throat> gross, right? So for your own good, don't we do that as parents and grandparents, right? We do spoil our kids or do we shape their character? Come on, right? We, we shape their character. Absolutely. Do we want to bless them? Yes. But shaping their character is first. And then he said, so whether you would keep his commandments or not. For us, that means Jesus. Will, will you follow Jesus? Will you cling to Jesus? Will you spend time with Jesus? Will you lean on Jesus? Will you listen to Jesus? Will you be responsive to Jesus? That's what it means for us. Keep going. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but, live, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That whole manna thing, supernatural manna for years and years that fell on the ground and they were tired of it and they wanted steak and potatoes, but they got manna, right? And God said, but, but I have a plan. I'm humbling you and I'm teaching you to depend on my every word, my every word. And that's why P Peter knew that. That's why when Peter said, Jesus is walking on the water. I could walk on the water, but I need to do it by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus, you say come, and I can walk on the water. You don't say come, I will sink. So my point there again, was it God's, was, was that available to Peter to walk on the water? Yes, and he knew that and he assumed that correctly and glorified God by assuming that. However, he would have been presumptuous if he would have just said, I can do it myself now and step out of the boat, sink. But instead, a humble heart said, Jesus, if you speak it, 
I need to have my eyes on you. I need to hear it from you. I need to be empowered by you. I need to be directed by you. And then he's walking on the water, right? All right, keep going. Your garments didn't wear out on you, nor did your foot swell those 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Chastens is, is really more for our understanding, would probably be better as disciplines, right? As a, as a man disciplines his son, raises and shapes and forms character and all of that, right? So the Lord your God disciplines and shapes you and forms you. Why? Because he's a father and he wants you to turn out good. Uh, he doesn't raise spoiled children, at least he's trying not to, right? So he's, he'll shape us, right? And we go, well, I don't like that part, right? <laughs> but it's for our good because he loves us. Go ahead. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Again, their relationship with God was through the law. Our relationship in the new covenant is through Jesus. So for us is, therefore, you shall walk with Jesus, stay close to Jesus, listen to Jesus, seek Jesus, be in your prayer closet with Jesus, right? Yeah, and to walk in, walk in everything that he leads you and shows you. Go ahead. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a, what? Good land, land of brooks of water, fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. Here's the promise. He's leading you into influence and success and fruitfulness, right? And prosperity. Isn't that what he wants for you? It is. It is. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that's just for preachers. That's for whatever your business, your career, your job, your social circle, your family. It's for you. Assume that God wants you to prosper and thrive and grow. He does. Amen. But he does not want entitlement. He doesn't want pride. He doesn't want presumption. He wants people whose hearts are very close and very responsive to him. Go ahead. A land of wheat and barley vines and fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you'll eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Be thankful. Go ahead. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his covenants, judgments, and statutes, which I command you today. For our case, clinging to Jesus, staying close to Jesus, responsive to Jesus. Go ahead. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. Uh, again, is that a promise for somebody else, not you? Or is that a promise for you also? Every promise in the Bible is yes and amen in Christ. Every promise of God is, is for you, and you should assume that. It glorifies God when you assume that, right? Not when you say, oh, that's not for me, it's not for me. I'm humble, that's not for me. No, it's not humble. That's called, uh, well, basically doubt and unbelief, really. It's God wants you to assume it's for you, right? Embrace it. Say, yes, God, yes, God. I want that. But go ahead. When your heart is lifted up, though, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. In other words, when things go well for us, we tend to get proud and cocky, don't we? It's just human nature. And God says, don't do that, right? <laughs> don't do that. Well, I led you through that great, terrible wilderness in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water. And I brought water for you out of the flinty rock supernaturally. And I fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, to humble you and that, to test you, to do you. What is it? What's that last part of that? to do you good in the end, right? God's always planning good for you. He's always planning increased, thriving, prosperity, and success for you. He is. He really is. But sometimes he's like, I got to shape your character first, right? I, I got to strip away some junk, right? Because I want to do you good, but yeah, okay. <laughs> that you would say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. That's the entitlement that we get to. In America, we're blessed because America started off as a nation of God, right? A nation that was seeking God and calling out on God and built on his principles. And God blessed America in a huge way, huge, huge way. That's why we're prosperous and powerful today as a, as a nation. But does this happen? A lot of people are like, yeah, we did this. There's no God. We did this. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Entitlement and, you know, I'm born, so I'm owed everything. Go ahead. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Is that also a, a promise from God for somebody else, not you? Or is that a promise for you? 
there you go, safely, rightly assume that all of his promises are for you. You're his born again son, daughter, covenant man, covenant woman. It's all for you, right? It's all for you. God's the same. This is his nature, right? Assume this is for you. But also remember, he wants, he wants to bless you. He wants to give you power to get wealth. Yeah, that actually in the, in the Hebrew there, there's a little bit more implication of even power to create wealth, like to generate wealth, right? Not just to get it coming in, but to sort of generate. That's very cool, right? Uh, yeah, but it's so he may establish his covenant. The idea is, but God wants, right? A heart that is true to Jesus aligned with his purposes, aligned with his calling, aligned with his kingdom, aligned with his nature. My heart belongs to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I, I'm, I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm about Jesus. Amen. Does God want to bless us? Yes. Does he also want to align our hearts and our character? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Our motives? Yes. All right. Um, what are some of the other symptoms of entitlement attitude? I, I've, I've kind of got... Uh, several verses here and we're doing good on time so let me share a few uh, Romans eight thirty seven. 37 uh, this verse says yet in all thing whoops there we go in all, th all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us yeah we're more than conquerors and uh, kind of the first thought I want to share with you one of the symptoms of entitlement though is self-pity and the reason I'm pairing it with this verse is because believing that you're more than a conqueror is the opposite of self-pity Amen. And self-pity. I think I preached on it like a whole Sunday, maybe about a year ago or so, uh, because at that time, God was dealing with me about some of that stuff. I know I'm the pastor. And, uh, you know, so I had, I had self-pity going on in myself, you know, and some self-pity is basically victim thinking, right? I'm just a victim all the time and I can't do anything about it. And it's somebody else's fault. Other people have it better than me. Woe is me. Right? And uh, I didn't realize I had some of that thinking. And uh, the Holy Spirit started to speak to me one day in prayer about self-pity. And, uh, you know, my first reaction, maybe like yours, would be, not me. <laughs> no self-pity here. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> and, uh, and then the Holy Spirit was like turning on the lights in my head. You know, it's like, yeah, but when you think like this and when you say this and, you know, when you go in a funk and disappear, you know, and in a black hole for a while and, you know. Oh, yeah. Self-pity. <laughs> and God's like, get rid of it, right? Just confess it. Get, ask me to take away. Get rid of it. And instead, adopt the thinking that you're more than a conqueror. Self-pity is for people that have no power, no God, no promises, no help. That, that's not us, is it? Right? We're more than conquerors. Christ lives inside of us. His kingdom is given to us, right? His authority is ours. He's our father. We have no room for self-pity. Um, and the opposite of that for us would be be proactive, right? If I'm tempted to get into self-pity, woe is me, I'm a victim, blah, 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 it's somebody else's fault. If I'm tempted to go into that place, uh, God wants me instead to be proactive, say, no, I'm more than a conqueror, and what am I going to do right now? God, what do I do? Jesus, tell me to walk on the water, right? Tell me to, right? Get, get before God, and, and, and sometimes, sometimes the thing you do right away is just get on your face before God, right? Just get away from any, everybody and everything, your prayer closet, get on your face before God, say, God, what do I do? Give me the breakthrough. I know that you're with me and I know that there's a solution. And I know that there's a victory to be had here. I assume that you're for me, not against me. What's the victory? What do I do? Cry out to God, right? And that's the right thing to do, right? The wrong thing to do is sit on the couch and go, oh, woe is me, right? So uh, self-pity thinking is, uh, it stinks, doesn't it? Right? It's basically secretly, it's a victim mentality where we secretly blame God for our permanent victim status. Uh, 2 Kings 13, 14 to 19. I love this story. I think we talked about the story a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago in a Tuesday night meeting. That Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So Elisha's, Elisha's going to die soon, but he still does one more prophetic act with the, the king of Israel. Elisha said to, to the king, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Took himself. <laughs> Sounds kind of southern there, didn't it? Took himself a bow and some arrows. 
<laughs> and he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window, and he opened it, and Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. All right, so the context here is Israel is at war with Syria, right? And God wants Israel to win because they're the covenant people and the promised land is supposed to be theirs and Syria, right? They're idol worshipers and, you know, horrible. And so basically God was like, defeat Syria. This is the promised land. I'm with you. I'm for you, right? So, so this is a prophetic act. Elisha tells him, shoot a, uh, an arrow out the window. It's a prophetic act for victory against Syria, right? Okay. Then uh, Elisha said, take the arrows. So the king took the arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck, he struck three times and stopped. Okay, now what? Okay. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. <laughs> And if I'm, if, if, if I'm the king of Israel, I would go, um, what? You're mad at me? I did exactly what you said. You said, strike the ground. Didn't say how many times. I went boom, boom, boom. Okay, I did what you said. Why are you mad at me? This was an unannounced test and the king failed the test. If you ever have an unannounced test when you're in school, the teacher said, I'm gonna find out what you got. <laughs> no time to study. I didn't tell you what the answers I'm looking for. I just want to find out what you got right now. So an unannounced test and the king fails the test. What was that all about? He was complacent. He didn't want it bad enough. He wasn't zealous for God. He wasn't zealous for Israel. He was just, he was just mediocre and complacent, right? He was entitled. He was, you know, and he's like, I did what you said. And Elisha said, no, this is what I wanted to see. <laughs> victory for Israel, victory from God against the Syrians, victory. That's what he wanted to see and he didn't see it. What does that have to do with us, right? God wants zeal. He wants, he wants believers like us who say, I want the next victory and the next victory and the next victory. My God is the God of breakthrough. My God is the God of the next victory, right? He wants me to thrive and prosper and be influential and fruitful and increase and make a difference. And he wants me to break through everything the enemy's ever done. Amen. And that zeal, again, what's the opposite of that? The entitlement. Well, I'm going to sit on my couch, God, you send me the blessings, postage paid. It's all good. You owe it to me, right? Mm -mm. No, go after the victory. God, get on your face. God, I want the next victory. God, I want the next breakthrough. Jesus, I want to walk on the water. Tell me to come. Speak to me. Give me a rhema word, right? My eyes are on you, right? That's what he wants. Extravagant responsiveness to Jesus. Amen? Not, yeah, whatever. And, and, and that's, a, that's a common thing in, in many of God's people. It's like, ah, oh, whatever. Okay. I got a ticket to heaven. I'm just waiting it out. Is that good enough? No, are you actually saved? Yeah, yeah, you got a ticket to heaven. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But what does God really want? Victory, victory. <laughs> I want Jesus. I want breakthrough. I want life. I want, right, influence. I want, right? I want all my loved ones saved. <clears throat> victory, victory, victory. I want breakthrough against this problem I have right now, right? The way the enemy's coming against me right now. I want victory. Get in my prayer closet and go after it. Amen? That's what God wants. That's what God wants. Go ahead, uh, 2 Samuel 5, 17 to 25. When the, this is about King David. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel. So he's 30 years old now. He's just become king of Israel. All the Philistines went up to search for David. The Philistines are the enemy. And David heard it and went down to the stronghold. And the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the Valley of Rephaim. They're going to make war against David, see if we can kill this new king, right? And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So what did David do right? He did two things right. First of all, he says, I assume, God, that you have victory for me. I assume that you are for me, not against me, that you will give me victory, that you will give me breakthrough. I assume it, I believe it, right? But I'm not gonna be presumptuous about it. 
I'm going to inquire. I'm going to ask, God, should I go up? Should I go up now? What should I do? Right? He's, he's making the correct decision not to be presumptuous. I'm going to get before God and ask until I hear God speak to me, and then I can walk on the water. Right? Then I'll have the word that, gives me, that lets me walk on the water. Are you with me on this? Okay. All right. So he asks, uh, he assumes that the answer is going to be good, but maybe God would have said go today. Maybe God would have said go tomorrow. I got to know, right? I got to know. Will God communicate with you if you seek him sincerely? Yes. The answer is yes. He will. If you seek him sincerely and you want to hear from God and you're, you're, you're going after it, he will communicate with you. Yes, he will. And that, that empowers you to walk on the water. The entitlement attitude is, I sit on the couch, God mails me the blessing postage paid because he owes it to me, right? Which is, no. So, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. God says, yes, go up now. So David went to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim, which means Lord of the breakthrough. So here's another one of those principles. David experienced God as Lord of the breakthrough. Is that a wonderful thing just for David and special people like David? Or is that a promise for you also? There you go. That's it. You say, oh, that's mine. That's mine. God is the Lord of the breakthrough. <laughs> that's mine. Just like that, just like that uh, woman from Tyre and Sidon, like, oh, no, I want this. I'm getting that. Right? If that's who you are, it's for me also. And God says, yeah, you get it. Way to go right? That faith glorifies God. But if you say, oh, that's for somebody else, not for me, right? That's self-pity. It's defeatism. And God goes, really? Really? Oh, I want you to know me better than that. That's for you, right? So God is the Lord of the breakthrough for you. And just like that, you know, King of Israel, we're supposed to go, God, you're the God of breakthrough for me, for me, for me. The next breakthrough, right, is me, is for me. And, and go after that. But like David, inquire of God. Don't presume. Say, God, what do I do and how do I do it? Right? So, go ahead. Then they left their images, their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. They're going to come after him again. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord. He does it again, doesn't he? And he said, um, and the Lord said, you shall not go up, circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. Uh, and there's more cool stuff after this, but I'm going to stop with that part because, I mean, I'm gonna, in this passage, I'm going to stop at this part because essentially David inquires of God again, and the inqu inquiry is, how do I do it? Now, he just, had a, he just had a great victory, didn't he? Couldn't he just have assumed the next victory and say, oh, we're just going to go fight, God will back us up? Yeah, he could have assumed that. We'll just fight, God will back us up, but he doesn't. He's not presumptuous at all. He says, God, okay, they're coming at us again. What do I do? Right? And God says, this time, you're going to make an ambush. God's literally giving him military strategy. Right? So what's the point here? Assume that God has victory for you. Assume that God has breakthrough, you for, breakthrough for you and he's with you. And go after that breakthrough. But always ask God what to do and how to do it. No presumption, no entitlement. Right? No laziness. No... You mail it in, God, you know, I'm on, you'll find me on my couch here, right? It's, all right, you get it. <laughs> um, how about, uh, jump to Philippians 2.14, please. This one's interesting. Do all things without, what? Complaining, that's got to be for somebody else. It's not for us. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, what I'm talking about is symptoms of entitlement, right? Symptoms of entitlement, which we don't want. It's, it's defeatist thinking. It's, it's uh, sabotage thinking. So it's not thinking like champions. So God says, do all things without complaining. We'll just focus on that one for the moment. That's interesting. Uh, it turns out God really doesn't like complaining. Right? Children of Israel got in a lot of trouble <laughs> in the Exodus story when they started complaining. Well, we don't like manna. We hate manna. We're tired of manna. Which, what else you got? Right. It, it didn't go well. Right. Complaining, I heard a, a preacher that I respect say, complaining is the language of slavery. Or you could say, complaining is the language of powerlessness. When we complain, the implication is, I have no power. I have no, no help from God. I have no access to any solutions. 
So it's easier to complain than it is to go after the solution in God, isn't it? It's way easier to complain. But it's the language of slavery. I'm a victim. I have no power. All I can do is complain. And God says, no, you're actually more than a conqueror in Christ. You're my child. And you have access to the mind of Christ and the voice of God and a God who is the Lord of the breakthrough, a God who is the God of victory and increase and blessing and prosperity. But don't have an entitled attitude. Go after God, right? Be, go after Jesus. Say, Jesus, what do I do? How do I do it? Right? I assume you've got breakthrough for me. I assume you've got a solution for me. I just, right? But show me how, right? Yeah. Um, ooh, that's, that's good, Pastor Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Complaining also feeds our flesh and our ego, doesn't it? Oh, it's awful, yeah. The, it, when, we, when we find ourselves complaining, just, you know, a good reminder is like, oh, that's slavery thinking. That's powerless thinking. But I have God in my life, amen, who is for me, not against me. Amen. And then you become proactive. And maybe, again, that, maybe that just means what I can do right now is go in my prayer closet, get on my face, and say, God, show me what's next. Show me what to do, right? I know you got breakthrough for me. I know, right? Um, and, and if God shows you what to do, and he will, right, then we're proactive and we do it. Uh, what's another one? Deuteronomy 5.21. I'm, I'm almost done, like two verses. Oh, remember this one from the uh, Ten Commandments? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments was you shall not covet. And uh, again, I don't usually preach out of the Ten Commandments because we are in the new covenant, which is Jesus. However, there is some really true principles here, right, that we need to understand. Why, why is, what does even coveting mean? It means I want what you got, right? You got something better than what I got. And I want yours. I want to, and usually that means I want to take away yours. I want to get it for me. I'll probably take it away from you, right? And uh, coveting is such a big deal that God made it one of the Ten Commandments. Right? <laughs> hmm, what does that mean? Uh, so one of the, the problem with coveting is, is it's, not that, it's not that it's wrong to want blessing. It's not that it's wrong to want good things. There's nothing wrong with wanting good things, wanting blessing. The idea is look at the, the next guy, the next person over and say, you have what I want. Why don't I have it? I need to get it for myself. I need to maybe even take it away from you, or I need to compete with you, or I need to sabotage you and exalt myself, or I need to, you know what I'm saying? Whatever it is, we, what's the problem with that? When we covet what somebody else has, what we're really saying is, I don't believe that God can bless me. I don't believe that God can give me that blessing, that breakthrough, that goodness. So I have to envy somebody else. I have to be jealous of somebody else. And again, that's powerless slavery thinking. It's, it's insulting to God, right? Uh, it's, it's many things. So the opposite of that is when you see somebody else that's blessed, you say, God, I believe you could bless me too. It doesn't have to look like that person but I believe you can bless me. And right, the principle is not that I have to have everything somebody else has, but the principle is, God, can, can I increase in blessing? Yes. Can you bless me and I increase in resources, I increase in influence, I increase in success? Yes, absolutely, right? It doesn't have to look like somebody else. It doesn't have to be equal to somebody else. But the idea is, I believe God can bless me. Amen? I believe God can give me a breakthrough and an increase. Yes. Uh, that's good. How about uh, last one? First Peter five, five and six. Uh, in this, uh, one of the other symptoms of uh, entitlement thinking is pride, and so Peter addresses pride here, uh, and he says, "Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, let all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble." Uh, that's just a Powerful, powerful principle. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Who's Peter writing to? Christians or unsaved people who have a problem with pride? <laughs> He's writing to Christians, isn't he? He's writing to believers. He said, God hates pride, right? But he loves humility. And in the principle is that God resists the proud, which means 
like, you know what it means to resist somebody? Like, ooh, you kind of make me want to throw up. Would you sort of back up a little bit here? Will you help me? Ugh. Not really. I can't stand your attitude. I don't even want to be around you, right? That's, that's what we got. It's like God resists the pride. He hates pride. He's like, can you get rid of the pride? And then we can be really good friends, right? But pride makes me want to vomit. Like, yes, you're saved and I love you and you're going to heaven, but pride, ugh. Like, really, that's how God feels about it, right? On the other hand, humility is like, oh, that smells beautiful. A humble heart, a sweet heart. Oh, God, I need you. I can't do this by myself. Oh, that smells good, right? Go ahead. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may, what? Exalt. That's what he wants to do. He wants to exalt you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to increase you and prosper you and make you influential, and, right? That's what he wants to do. He says, I, I, I will do that for you. You don't do that for yourself. I will walk you into that by my grace if you will have a humble heart. And instead of an entitled heart, God, you owe it to me, right? Send it, postage paid. Now, seek God, be responsive to Jesus, right? Humble yourself and say, Jesus, lead me every step of the way. Give me every breakthrough, Jesus, right? I want, I want that. Mm. I'm going to listen to your voice. I'm going to press in. And when you say come, I'm going to walk on the water, right? That's how we live. That's how we increase. We assume that God has blessing and prosperity for us, and he does. In influence and fruitfulness, and he does. But man, it's, right? No entitlement, no pride, no presumption. <laughs> no ego, no flesh, all of those things sabotage, right? No complacency, no self-pity, all those things are sabotaging to us. And we're champions, so we can't afford any of that stuff. Amen? <laughs> all right, good. Well, heard somebody say, I preached myself happy, so I hope it was good for you too. <laughs> so, all right, let's, uh, let's pray. We can stand together and... We'll just take a, a few moments here and respond to the message. That's what we want to do is take a few moments. If you're comfortable standing, that's great. Please do. And then we'll just close your eyes for a few moments and come face to face with Jesus again. Come heart to heart with God. And if you've, well, let me pray first. Holy Spirit, I pray that you fill everybody again in this moment spirit of revelation, wisdom, and the knowledge of God. Fill everybody here, spirit of truth, precious spirit of God. Teach us and lead us into all truth, empowering your people. So God, I pray that you would give everybody in here the revelation that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ. Even every implied promise, even the picture of nets full of fish is an implied promise for all of your people because it's who you are, God. And that all of us would have that, that starting assumption, every promise is for me. So would you actually say that with me? Say, Lord, I believe, I choose to believe that every promise from you is for me because it's who you are. Yeah. But also, just take a minute as you're in the Lord's presence. The other part of the message was any symptoms of entitlement thinking, presumption, pride, self-pity, complacency, you owe it to me. Any, any thinking like that, if you related to any of those things, just between, between you and God right now, would you just say, God, yeah, I have some of this. Take it out, take it out. Take out the entitlement from me, God. Take out complacency. Take out self-pity, complaining. victim thinking take it out take it out God I don't want it I want champion thinking God I want champion I want more than conqueror thinking
Holy Spirit, breathe on your people. Bring deliverance, bring transformation right now. Bring uh, empowering, bring champion thinking, Holy Spirit. More than conqueror thinking. Every one of your people, God, they're champions. They're gonna prosper, they're gonna increase in health. They're gonna increase in mental health and confidence and happiness. They're gonna be influential for Jesus. Their hearts are aligned and coming into alignment with Jesus. Not living for themselves, but living for Jesus. Living for God in increasing blessing, increasing prosperity, success, influence, increasing ministry, increasing Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Can you just take another moment? Just lift our hands one more moment, please. Just, just drink in. Say, fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Yes, come upon us all. Fill us. Fill us. Pour into us, Holy Spirit anointing us, empowering us, leading us into every victory, every breakthrough. Holy Spirit, fill us ha, with champion thinking. Fill us with faith. Ha, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Fill our hearts. Fill our minds. Fill our homes. Fill our families, our marriages, God. God bless you all. Everybody doing good?